here I am trying to like put nipples on a Lego figure for a living. And if anybody wants to buy it, that's like such a blessing to me. Bring me the next. Hey everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Big Bad Big Cast. I'm your host, Brett, aka Geek Over 40. And today I'm joined by Phil and Carrie, known as Phil uh Backhead Bricks and Kirby Inner Bricks. Unfortunately, Zach and Nick were gonna be here, but due to the rescheduling of this episode recording, they've had other family and work obligations. Our guest today is the leading producer of pad printed custom figs and accessories. They've been around since 2010 and have been responsible for sets and figs that have literally gotten worldwide attention from both mainstream media and without a doubt, one of the most loyal and passionate communities in the minifigure business. And if you have any doubt about that passion, I have received more listeners submitted questions for this interview than any other, more than PCB and Jaka combined. So ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome Joe, creator and owner of Citizen Brick. Hi, thanks for having me. So, but this isn't actually your first interview with a podcast. You also did one with Billy on Instagram yep. known as BM4 with yep. the Bricks and Banter. You know, I, I highly recommend everyone to go check out that podcast. I'll have a link in the show notes. You can find all sorts of great interviews and insights into a, a variety of subjects related to minifigs and customization. And the CB1 in particular is episode number 36. I actually talked to Billy about doing this because I want to make sure I'm not just retreading what he's already done. I'm trying to take a different angle, sort of get his blessing. Of course, he said, just go for it. And, They'll knock it out. So, yeah. Did he? Did you talk to him about the unreasonable list of demands that I gave him and my my contract writer? <laughs> <laughs> no, but trust me, we're gonna follow up on some things you had said. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah. Well. <laughs> so, but just to, just to get everyone up to speed who may not be aware of System Brick, give us the TLDR and how this all came to be. <sighs> um, I, I, the shortened version, I keep trying to sweeten it every time someone asks me to make it sound more heroic than it is. But honestly, I was just um, teaching college. I was teaching printmaking, which is my background. And I had really not really thought about Lego too much until about the same time my, my two sons were probably too young for Lego. But I did have two boys and I was scrambling around to find toys for them and thinking like, oh, I can't wait till they're old enough to play with this, can't old enough to play with this. And I I retrieved my childhood Lego collection from my parents' house and said, all right, they're a little too young for this. And just kind of going through it, uh, which was pretty well intact, you know, from the 30 years before that. Um, I, I always liked the printed parts. I always thought they were super cool. And you know, so specific. My favorite was always like the little um, rotary telephone one by two slope brick because I show it to my kids now and they have no idea what that's supposed to be. They've never seen a rotary <laughs> phone before. So I was always kind of fascinated with the printed parts and I was a printer by trade at that point. And I just wanted to see almost kind of like out of a frustration of my job was kind of a bummer at the time. And I was my art career my studio gallery career if you could call it that it was kind of like in limbo or no man's land so i just kind of as a, a hobby or just kind of like uh, a little side quest to figure out if i could take my mind off of my you know situation um i said i wonder if i could figure out how to print on stuff like i i, I know how to print stuff i wonder if i could figure it out and then doing a little bit of research i, I looked on youtube and i found a. Uh, uh, a video. I've never been able to kind of find it again, but it was like an inside the Lego factory. And I remember it was a clip of them printing stormtrooper helmets, like eight up, like eight at a time. And I had never seen that machine before. And I did a little kind of reverse engineering research and uh, figured out that it was pad printing and then started to kind of look into what a pad printing press looks like and kind of started from there, but it was very modest and very, um, I was really not aware of AFOLs or custom Lego being a thing or anything like that. Um, it was really, I was just one man kind of working in the wilderness thinking this would be kind of a silly little side project. And then I realized that there was kind of a, there was a little community to support it. And that's what kind of got me going. I bought this $400 hand 
cranked uh, pad printing machine that I bought off of eBay. And it was at the time I, you know, I had two little kids and I was teaching part time and uh, mortgage and all this other stuff. So it seemed like a ridiculous kind of splurge to buy a $400 machine to do a thing. I didn't know if it would work. So I bought this little machine and I kind of spent about six months, seven months in my third bedroom in this condo, just trying to like figure it out and and calling and harassing and annoying a local pad printing supply place saying like, okay, but how do you do this? And okay, but like, you know, they didn't want to, they were used to dealing with professionals, not like a weird hobbyist who was trying to print on a, something they never used before. I think the final straw was I just showed up at this place unannounced and asked if I could like hang out with one of the technicians. And, and looking back on it, this was like super aggressive and annoying on my part that I just kind of like this random guy just shows up at your workplace and was like, hey, do you mind if I just shatter you and you can show me how to make a pad printing plate? And I remember that a lot of the kind of um, – people there were super annoyed that I was there and a lot of kind of like sideways glances, like who is this guy and why is he showing up at our office? And there was one technician who was super into it. He was like, Oh, I think it's cool what you're trying to do. And he kind of took me through the whole process. I think he got yelled at later for that because he was, (laughs) I was definitely in some like restricted areas I was not supposed to be in, but he, he walked me through it made a plate for me, showed me how to load up the press and like gave me some sample links and kind of pushed me out the door. And that was kind of like the crack that I needed in the dam to be like, Oh, okay, now I know what I'm doing. Or at least I got some direction. Um, Are you, uh, are you still in touch with that guy? No, I've never seen him before since. Maybe he was just like an (laughs) angel. I don't know. (laughs) Maybe he was a (laughs) real person, but um, yeah, it was cool to just like, I, I love talking shop. I love talking about printing. And I kind of hit it off with this guy and he's like, oh, come here, I'll show you how to do some stuff. And he made made a plate for me, gave me a pad, that kind of stuff, and kind of got me on the right foot. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, I don't think I mentioned that on Billy's thing, but little bits of it come back to me as, as like, you know, there's nothing else in my kind of professional life that I got this far into this fast. And once I kind of figured that out, and I remember I printed like the first neutral face on this little hand crank machine and I was super excited and I ran around, showed my family and they just like, didn't get it. (laughs) I was like, no, you don't understand. I made a Lego part. Like, I mean, I printed one the same way that they print one. It's exactly the same. It's like, it's like, uh, I matched the DNA of a real Lego part and that was exciting. So once I did that, I kind of made a little, you know, the very first wave of, of products that I made. And then in rapid succession, I went to my very first brick world, Chicago. I was talking, we were talking about this cause we just did that show a couple of weeks ago, how naive I was at that show. I just showed up with a suitcase full of stuff that I had printed. And I remember having to explain a lot again and again, like who, who I was and what I was doing there kind of thing. Like I had one little tiny table with no kind of like, you know, the branded elements that we kind of have now. It was just like a, a guy with a suitcase full of minifigures that I had made myself or printed myself, whatever. And having to explain like, no, 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 I printed these. Like, no, 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 I'm making custom, you know, it, it was just like a lot of head scratching. They didn't understand what these were. So it was kind of like had to be a real evangel, you know, evangelist for for the, the thing I was into at that moment. So... As it stands right now, how big is the team? Uh, it depends if you count my teenage kid who's been kind of here or there, hit or miss uh, this summer. Right, including including child labor. Big. Oh, well, that's that's a lot more. I would say <laughs> we have two, four, six, including including undocumented children that we have, probably seven or eight people working right now. Yeah. And how many printers? We have three presses going um, four days a week is just kind of our, we have a pretty short week. I kind of like it that way. We, we work six hours a day, four days a week. Uh, I'm in the shop 24 hours a day. I, I live there all the time, but there's one day a week where I kind of do, you know, creative stuff and, 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 you know, not managing the place one day a week is the day I kind of just like draw, you know, and you're, you're still the only designer, correct? Yeah. Um, for better or worse, I think, 
that is probably more a function of my inability to kind of unclench and <laughs> let somebody else, uh, you know, drive the car for a while. It's more, it's more, more kind of like my control freakiness than anything else. Do you let the team sort of weigh in with the designs or do you pitch things to them or is it yeah. like a total... Yeah. Uh, so if there is a democracy, then it's not just uh... <laughs> no, not a democracy. I wouldn't go that far. It's uh... come down from the mountain. <laughs> um, no, I do like, really like bouncing ideas off people. I would say that uh, some of the best CB ideas are not mine, um, but came in this kind of like round table where we kind of spitball ideas. Um, I always say like. I welcome all ideas, but you have to be braced for me to to make a face. But like, no, I hate that. You know, I'm not very good at pretending like, oh yeah, it's pretty good. Maybe we'll just put that on the list. Like, if I if I don't like it, I just there's like a visceral reaction. So, uh, no, I love it. I wish like to be in the boss, though, isn't it? You know, <laughs> they Did can't say all... anything back. And they... <laughs> yeah. Are you yeah, also I... the designer for like the sets, like the lowrider and? You know, and the um, club and the meth lab. You no, know, I did do the low rider. That was me. But um, the other two sets were a guy who was working with us at the time named Brian, who was really talented. I kind of found him. He's no longer with the company. He's, he's moved on to other other professions, I think. But um, he was like a he was taking photos of our stuff, and I you would see him popping up on Flickr. And then I noticed his name was in Chicago, and we were in Chicago, so. When he would order stuff from us, we would write on the envelope like, "Hey, man, you gotta, you gotta get in touch," you know, because um, we really like your stuff. And we hired him kind of because of that. He was he was doing that on his own, um, and he was a really talented builder too, not something I claim to be. And he made those first two sets: the Meth Lab and the the Center for the Performing Arts. Those are all his. Okay, so um, we've got more questions about the process and the business itself, but. Mm-hmm. It's been my habit to dive right into the hot topics of the community yeah, yeah. that people are tuning in for. And I want to know, in your opinion, how do you feel that the new revamp Citizen Brick Day went? And then after that, Brick World? Oh, OK, cool. All right. So I, I will I will kind of give some context this by saying that nobody could be more grateful to the fact that I'm still doing this after all this all these years than me. Like, I think this is all to be attributed to really loyal fans and loyal customers and people who just coming back and really appreciate what we do. It kind of is what gets me up in the morning that we have such a cool group of people who follow us. Um, So the last thing I would ever dream of doing is kind of coasting or cutting corners or kind of phoning it in or however you want to phrase it. Like it's very important that we meet people's, um, enthusiasm with our own. That's important. So that being said, trying to find a way to run this business with n- zero business background <laughs> uh, is, is kind of my cross to bear. I, I'm making this up. We always say that like Citizen Brick is like a house that we're building from the roof down. Like we kind of came out of the gate with some success and and have been able to support ourselves. I've been I've never had, you know, I, I've been only doing this for about nine years now, I think. So I'm very lucky that this could be my kind of main focus. I know that some of the other guys you've had that, you know, they split their time between a real day job, but this is all I do. <sighs> so it's very important to me to kind of like do it in a way that that puts our customers first, if that doesn't sound too cheesy. How that applies to Citizen Brick Day is, and I, going back to what I said before about not all good ideas are mine, Citizen Brick Day originally was not my idea. It was my kind of a creative partner, buddy of mine named Duncan, who was kind of foundational in starting the company way back when. He just said, you should just do, you know, you should just try and sell off all these misprinted pieces. Someone out there is going to want them. And and it was a great idea. It was probably one of the best ideas, you know, in, in this in this company. And I think you could see that a lot of companies have a version of that kind of same idea. So I think that's proof that it was a pretty good idea. But I, I always liken it to being like a party, like, oh man, we, we threw a party. I got to make sure I have enough chips. I got to make sure I have enough beer. I got to make sure, you know, I put up enough lawn chairs, that kind of stuff. So I'm kind of like, during the time that we kind of say, all right, Citizen Brick Day is on the calendar. 
it really becomes like the focus of everything I do for a couple of months. And it has grown kind of exponentially every year. And we've, we've tried different formats in the past. Um, I think to anybody who's listening, who doesn't really know what we're kind of dancing around, what we used to do was put up thousands of non-production parts is what we call them. Kind of like the colorways of production designs We print them on a different color or rare stuff or discontinued stuff, or really just kind of the, the vault or whatever you want to call it of, um, citizen brick stuff. You couldn't just buy on the website and putting together that many kind of combos of figures by myself takes me like two months sometimes to kind of like get them all done. And what we were finding just based on the numbers of last year was that nine people were showing up to the website for the sale for every figure that we had for sale, which is like a mind blowing kind of amount of traffic for us, you know, and you know, the panic of like, Oh man, you know, all these people are showing up to fight over these very limited amount of supplies. There's, there's a fine line, right? Between it being like a little bit of a hype, like, Oh, it's a limited thing and you might not get it. And then it kind of spills over into just being like a bad business practice. You just start having like eight people showing up when you told them to show up and eight out of nine of them are walking away empty handed. That's like, that's not a sustainable model. So we decided to not do that and to try and find a way to, be a little more, um, uh, I don't know what the right word is, um, judicious about how we spread stuff out, you know, try and sprinkle them out over the year more than just one. It's like trying to end, empty like a football stadium through one set of doors. Like the traffic is just not manageable for us. It sounds like we're bragging, but it's like, it was really like, it's something that really bothered me. I hate when people kind of like, want to give you money and you have not allowed them to do that for whatever reasons, that's just bad business to me. Well, so. let me, let me caveat that real quick in that one of the concerns that I've got repeated questions about is the international market no longer being able to, to acquire Miss Prince, uh, on the, you know, on the uh, website and this, this shift to conventions and special events. There are folks that are overseas that cannot do this in person. So, yeah. I mean, now, granted, with any party, you can get those right chips and those folding chairs, but then someone's going to complain about the music. There's always yeah. the minute you're going to please somebody, everybody is the minute you're going to piss off somebody. But I don't think this kind of is parallel with that, in that you know you've got these folks that are passionate. You've built up this international market. Yeah, you've grown so large, but now how do you afford them the opportunity while also making sure that the U.S. based folks don't scoop it all up? Well, it's a, it's a thing I'm really wrestling with. Like, um, <clears throat> I've been really trying in a way that's not kind of like my comfort zone, diving into like the analytics of who are we selling to and who's coming to buy our stuff and how many people, where are they from? And the international part of our customer base is pretty big. And I think that's just because of Lego, like Lego kind of being a European product that it's at it, in its origin. Um, we have, you know, it's just huge over there. So we, we struggle with trying to serve everybody all over the globe. And we're certainly not turning our backs on that. I think part of the reason we did Citizen Brick Day originally was so that we could do like a shipping holiday and give um, international customers like free or discounted shipping. We've tried it different ways over the years. So I would say that, you know, part of it is a communications issue on my part. Uh, I don't know that I explained the change in format, the way that it, you know, it caused some confusion, I'll admit. But I would say that bottom line, nobody is getting less access to Citizen Brick stuff. And hopefully everybody is getting more over a longer span of time and not having to like get up at two in the morning, wherever you are and try to fight for something and then not getting it. You know, that's, that's a, a tease I don't want to be responsible for. So I think, you know, there's only like, we only go to like six conventions a year. So there's no way I can, can just like serve all that stuff there. So right. we're, we're working on ways, whether it just be like a, a kind of a flash sale or saying like we're doing a military only sale, or we've even kicked around the ideas of doing like free shipping for all international customers this weekend. You know, so we're, we're trying, you know. Oh, sorry, I like that idea. Sorry. I like that idea. Keep going. <laughs> yeah. 
As well, a reminder, it's, Carrie's in Canada. So. No, I know. Um, you know, this is another change that I, I, I'll say it now, but by the time you get this out to your listeners, I'm sure many will have noticed, we're trying out something now where there's a switch on our shopping cart platform where we are, uh, where the shopping cart platform itself is handling international orders. I don't want to bore everybody with this kind of detail. Oh, but no, they, no, it's not the localized pricing because we are. Oh, yeah. yeah, it terrified me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now okay. I know what I'm actually spending. Me too. Yeah. And it's actually, I'm not sure it's going to work because apparently like every other outlaw element of this business, we were not presenting people's duties and customs fees up front. I don't know how we could do that. I really don't know. But now the shopping card shows people what they're spending in their local currency and what all the taxes and fees are and has DHL shipping. And just by looking at how many kind of like abandoned shopping carts I've had today, uh, a lot of people are suddenly shocked um, at what it costs to buy stuff from us internationally. Hopefully the trade-off is that with DHL shipping, I don't want to do a commercial for them, but that's the option that we have right now. And they'll get stuff to you in like three days, which is kind of amazing. Oh yeah, no, they're great. I, can, I get, can, I get can a lot I of say, stuff DHL. Can I say one thing about DHL? Sure. Yeah, yeah. They're very fast. Like um, True Red uses them and it's coming from Italy. It'll take like two to three days to get here. But they always charge duty to international. Yeah. Like always we're doing through US posts. Like sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Yeah. Yeah. So, from our end, when they don't, what happens, especially in the UK, a lot of times it just gets bounced back. So we spend like not an insignificant amount of time chasing international orders and talking to the Royal Mail or the post office in in Ireland, trying to figure out why these things are coming back to us. So as much as I like to be kind of like a pirate figure about this stuff and like, ah, oh, I don't care about, you know, Belgian taxes. <laughs> we're trying to do it the legitimate way just so that people get their stuff because we're getting a lot of stuff kind of sent back. So, so well, you know, I mean, back they have to order stuff in the first place so i just want to circle back and yeah. just clarify you are working on or exploring options for misprints access for international customers yeah yeah absolutely they're, no. getting, they're, getting that, they're getting that double sting they're they're not getting a chance to get it <laughs> and then they have to deal with the people that do get them trying to resell it at an inflated price mm. i'm good just that everybody try to move to america um <laughs> <laughs> Uh, in the upper Midwest. That would be most convenient for me. I'm not saying everybody has to. I'm just saying that would be the way that we can ensure the best possible service. One, one thing that I've done, and Phil can attest to this, is, and I've offered this to Carrie as well, is I, it's a lot of times, like Phil, you know, is over, overseas. He he buys stuff and then just gets it shipped to my house. So like my my address probably shows up, it shows up under two names under, you know, your company. Yeah. Yeah. I'm proud to be a member of the family by now, but uh, yeah. Brett, Brett Dox is a Lego rat hole for me. I've, so. got, <laughs> I've got about a six pound box of Citizen Brick figs that yeah. he's collected in the mass of my house between the reseller market and the actual website. Uh, that <laughs> yeah, I find fact, we were just uh, we were just talking. I have to do the mail away the mail away uh, you know dick part because he's boogie night set sitting in my in the box waiting to be mailed yeah. out to the UK. Yeah. So I have to open that thing up and mail that in. Yeah. I think some people, um, you know, the fact is like if you order five bucks worth of custom printed Lego parts from Citizen Brick, it's going to cost like 30 bucks to send it if you are on the other side of the planet. So your option is to either like get a freight forwarder. Some some of the more clever guys far away have figured that out. Have yep. a friend mail it to you. I, I really, this is really out of my depth, I'm doing the best we can to figure it out. Yeah. But. So for those listening, yes, I have friends that are in uh, Korea. I have friends that are in Taiwan. And when I have stuff for them to send, I just send it to their warehouse. They've got one. Someone's, one's got a warehouse in Delaware. One's got a warehouse in uh, Portland. Oregon. Yeah. yeah, in Portland. It only cost me five bucks to ship it to them. And then they figure out the rest from there. Yeah. That's one way. Uh, I just got a Facebook message from my buddy in Poland. He's like, hey, look, Brickmania's got this drop coming. Is it all right if I send it to your house? I'm like, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I'm, I would I would welcome any suggestions for anybody. We're trying. It's kind of an evolving thing. I, It's not about me being in perfect compliance with everybody's customs you know, departments, but it's more like um, – 
people aren't getting their stuff. And that's kind of, you know, they're waiting like two, three mm-hmm. months for stuff and it's not showing up. And then it comes back to me two, three months. And that to me is like, you know, I think it, I think we're obliged to make sure the best way possible that it gets to them the best we can. So um, yeah, it's getting more expensive to ship internationally for sure. All right. And um, so for those who are domestic and can get um, what they, what they need, there was a little bit of contention regarding the um, how brick for all went down your, your open, your headquarters open house. And I was that, was that a, was that an on the fly decision or was that something you already planned? Or? No, you know, we did it. You talk about the open house after. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm yeah. pissed because I, I wasn't a brick roll and I just couldn't, I missed everything. So. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I've already decided I'm going next year, so, but uh, the, um, the, the, the contention was, how the phrasing was and explaining how misprints were handled, uh, how they'd be available in one place, but they wound up being available in another place. So there was a bit of a back and forth. So I just want to give you a chance to clear the air on how this all goes down. I'll do what I can because there's nothing, you know, I'll I'll clear the air for you. It's your own fucking business. You do what you want, (laughs) how you want to handle it. No, no. (laughs) That same, like, I want to make sure I got enough chips and beer for everybody. You know, I like if we threw the party, I want to make it a good party. So, I, I, you know, people say they email me and go, Hey, can, you know, I'm going to be in Chicago or I'm driving through. And for the record, everybody, this is another thing we're working on. We're not actually physically located in Chicago anymore. I was in uh, Texas last weekend and I met a family who said like, you know, we, we knocked on the door and you weren't there. I said, were you in, like trying to go to our Chicago address? And uh, they said, yeah. So we haven't been there for like three or four years and that that's not their fault. It still says that in a lot of places. So there's, this is just it's another website. Yeah. Yeah. This is another feature of me being like a, uh, a poor to mid business operator, but a, hopefully a good designer of custom Lego parts. So I said like, Hey, sorry, you know, so people, you know, people will email and be like, Hey, I'm coming through Chicago or, or Illinois. Can we stop at your shop? And I'll admit that we used to be a little bit more like, hey, yeah, come on in. We'll show you around. And we're a little less. I, it was great because I used to blame it on COVID. But now, <laughs> now, it's just like, uh, now it's like, no, nah, I just want to take two hours and show you around kind of thing. So it's we're not as kind of open door policy as we used to be. It just it takes a I find that I'm not terribly entertaining in person, I think. So um yeah we're not what, doing like shop tours that much you know but what if the next person that calls is the next joe just trying to learn something <laughs> that's happened and, too i had to ask people like hey can you stop taking notes <laughs> stop taking so, <laughs> so now now you know how they felt when you were in there trying to be aggressive and learn yes. the process no, no i i can smell that i know that that kind of you know i know the look on somebody's face when they're trying to mem- memorize the business kind of thing um wearing a little body cam <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah so it's a fine line, right? Like I'm still amazed after all these years that anybody wants to kind of see how this is done. Uh, and I like to be kind of hospitable about it, but it is kind of like tough to do if it happens a couple times a week. So back to the original po- question, like we're close to Brick World Chicago. That's not definitely our hometown show. We're about 20, 25 minutes south of uh, where that convention is. So we just kind of, it started a couple of years ago saying like, Hey, once you're driving out of town on Monday morning, you can swing by the shop. I'd be happy to show you around. And it's definitely kind of swelled over the last couple of years to where people show up and they shop, you know, I'm not, it's, it's not meant to be like an after party or kind of like a special reserve of stuff that we didn't sell at the show. But this, this is to anyone listening. I would gladly sell you anything that you want to buy. <laughs> There's no kind of like <laughs> rationing. I spent years trying to buy back a lot of the original Citizen Brick parts because I was so eager to sell anything to anybody who in- was interested that I never kept one for myself. So like my my CB collection is probably less complete than some of our other customers. Um, so, uh, the people scalp you when you try and get them back. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I paid way <laughs> from my own stuff almost to the point where i said you know what it's just cheaper for me to remake this myself (laughs) (laughs) 
so yeah, it, it's not meant to be like a like secret VIP hangout. Um, but also it wasn't, it was kind of like invite only. I just want like a lot of people, you know, carry included travel very far. Um, and we just want to show them a uh, good Midwestern hospitality. So I said, Oh, if you want to come see us, you know, see the shop, you can. So I right, back to your original question, like the way we make stuff, especially with the kind of increased capacity that we seem to have lately we're making a lot of stuff and we're making it a lot faster than we used to uh, i'm very happy about that but that means like between brick world chicago a couple of weeks ago and brick fair virginia in a week or two we've made like a ton of new stuff so just by the nature of like when you catch us on the road we're gonna have all new stuff not to add any more fuel to the fire but when we you know Brick Fair, Virginia is going to have a pretty healthy stash of new stuff. We're going to sell some figures, pre-made figures, very similar to what we do with Citizen Brick Day. And we made more of them than I expected to be able to. So some people are going to go, hey, wait a minute. Why are you doing Citizen Brick Day this way now? Like it's, you know, I can't. It's a learning process. It's it's definitely a learning process. I think with, with the goal being to try and get everybody to give me their money <laughs> and, 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 and not to beat the drum, but we, while also still formulating a plan for the international market. Yeah. Oh no, no. Yeah. No, it's <laughs> not. The reason we started system brick day partially besides just being the suggestion of my buddy was that I got an email from a kid in Belgium saying like, man, what am I supposed to do? Like I want your stuff, but all this cool stuff is not available to me. So we did system brick day as kind of like a, all right, here's for everybody else that we don't see in person. So we're trying, and the only answer I found over the years is to just make way more stuff. You know, it's just to keep making parts available. It's I, I've said this on other places, and I, I want to underline it again, since we're kind of like in this collectible toy space, that I personally hate false scarcity, like artificial scarcity, where you're like, oh, we only made nine of these. You know, if we only... If we make nine of something, it's because we broke the press that day. You know, we don't, I don't like hold stuff in reserve and like drop it later. I don't do any of those kind of tricks that I think, um, you know, when we say it's limited edition, it's truly limited edition. When we number something, we don't make more of it. And this might kind of touch on some of your other questions. With um, the, with the, with the team Ninja, Ninja Turtles, the recent Turtles, would that fall into that category? Because they seem to go really quick and I don't, yeah, I don't yeah. I'm not recalling how many sets you made. I'll tell you, I think we made 93, I want to say, maybe 94 if you count the one that I've got. And that's because it was four full green monochrome figures um, times 100. So it's like 400 clean, brand new green torsos, which are hard to come by. So it was right. like, it's a pretty good um, run initially times, you know, divided by four. That's how you ended up with that number. I... I, it's crazy for me to try and sell something, make something that's a, an addition of a hundred. If I think I can, if I think there's a thousand people that want it, you know, we make, we literally make as many as we can. And I'm happy to say that we don't have a lot of leftovers. So we're not, we're not keeping numbers down. If you notice, like our prices have barely crept up over the last 13 years. I mean, Oh yeah. We're, we're going to talk about that. Don't worry. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you, sh that's fine. I'd like to talk about it. Cause um, as a, father of three kids, two of whom are like have college on the horizon. I'm a very frugal custom Lego buyer myself, you know, and I will say, I'm not going to name any, but I will say that there are custom minifigures on the market that are set at prices that I just think are kind of like pretty high, you know, for, oh, oh yes, <laughs> definitely yep. fall into that category of like, well, this is too much of a spend for me. So I don't want to be that. So you know, I'd rather make a thousand of something at $25 than 10 of something at $250 or whatever that math is. You know what I mean? I, I, I've told this story before and I'm sorry if I'm kind of like taking up everybody's mic. No, time. this is, this, this is why you're here. Okay. This is, we're grateful that you're able to, you showed up. <laughs> this is all about you. Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> no days. When I was, uh, it's like my birthday. Um, when I was a kid, teenager, this is like pre-internet era, I was really into punk music and would write away letters with stamps on them to record labels, little kind of out of the garage record labels. And when I get a package in the mail back with like the seven inch records that I would buy, 
a lot of times you get a bunch of extra swag like pins or stickers, lots of stickers uh, or extra stuff like, hey, if you like this, you might like this. And almost always like a handwritten note from the guy who was like running the label saying like, hey, thanks. And that kind of experience of opening up those packages and feeling like I was part of a community, even if I wasn't physically there for it, was a big, like, that left a pretty big impression on me. And I don't know that we're doing that for anybody, but I definitely want, we try to communicate to people that we are so excited that they buy our products, you know. I know to exactly it. what you're talking about. My uh, my daughter, both my kids growing when they were younger were really big Five Nights at Freddy fans. And yeah. for a class project, they had to write a, a fan letter. And my daughter wrote um, to Scott Cawthorn, the creator. Yeah. And she got this massive box full of signed swag and just lit her up. It's still on her shelf. And it's been like five years. Yeah. I'm sure he can't believe that people want, you know, like I, that, that excitement doesn't really go away. So when people buy our goofy products, I'm super psyched. I couldn't, you know, we never get kind of like um, casual about that. It's really kind of important to us. We try to turn stuff around really fast, try and keep the prices low. I want to be, I want, you know, this is a cliche, but like today's public is tomorrow's a foals kind of thing. Like if kids are into this hobby and they want, you know, the thing that's going to help them stay in it is having a great experience with whatever part of it they engage with. So you know, a lot of kids, and I say kids, and we have a lot of adult collectors, obviously, but to some people who buy our stuff, this is like their allowance or their lunch money or their grandma's birthday money or whatever. And it's like a big deal to a kid who sends you money. It's kind of like a, a real... Wait a minute. Wait a minute. This is the birthday money they got from their grandma, not their grandma's birthday money. <laughs> Whether it's the only thing they're not, not saying good. Don't steal from grandma. A little good. assholes. You know? <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? Like, it's, you know five bucks to a kid is a big deal. So I think it's kind of like on us to do a good job, you know, and not leave them disappointed. So we try really hard to keep the prices down and the quantity is up and it ends up, you know, we run ourselves kind of ragged a lot trying to keep that going. I wish I could just make like 50 figures and charge 200 bucks a figure and then take the rest of the day off, you know, could learn how to go golfing or something, you know, but it takes a lot of balancing to keep, you know, keep quantities up and prices low for sure. All right. So speaking of quantity up, prices low. So again, I'm going to plug Billy's podcast, Bricks and Banter, because you guys had an excellent discussion regarding uh, the reseller market. And I don't want to just go over all that over again. Um, but I mean, we can all agree there are, you know, bad actors out there who tend to buy stock for the sake of scalping or reselling. Yeah. And there's nothing you're responsible for or should be held accountable for because, you know, once you sell it, it's out of your hands. But you once said, um, and this, and I quote, I figure if you can't get it from me directly, it's mostly my fault. We address that by increasing production. And just, just follow me on this road for a minute. So that being said, there was a time in the past, one of those aforementioned bad actors bought a large stock of the infamous black light skeleton fig. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and the hoarding and the scalping resulting from that made the fig near impossible to find a secondhand market. Would you ever consider doing a reprint? Yeah. Um, and it, and it's not to, you know, capsize someone's investment or anything or spite or anything like that. You know, like I said before, like when things are scarce that come out of our shop, it's usually due to like a real world thing. Um, that that powder that we use to make things UV reactive was given to us like third hand by somebody and I haven't been able to get more of it very easily. So it's just like, yeah, they're they're gone because we can't make any more kind of thing. I'm not saying, but if someone, someone, if I was able to get my hands on the same materials, I would do it. It's, just, it's like that visible man figure we did last month. I, I only had X amount of parts to print on. And all day long, I answer emails saying like, hey, you coming back out with this? You can make more of them. Well, there was a few folks that, that grabbed like 20 of those things too. No, so. I, not, not on my watch. Not that I know of. Um, uh, no, I, if they ended up with them, I'm not, they must've done it outside of us because I think, I think by my math, somebody bought three over the course of a day. That's the most that they got. More people kind of worryingly ended up with multiples of my sig fig, which that's a whole other topic that makes me super <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh, 
I, I saw I saw the photo of the one that, that Zach made of you. Oh yeah. So, <laughs> so we saw it last night. Um so yeah, I mean, these are all moments in time that some of them I could I wish I could redo. Do I wish I had sold all of those leftover UV figures to one person? No, but I probably needed the money at that moment. <laughs> right. No, it's fair. Um, so, <laughs> so all the time, you know, I'm uh, not, I'm not a chemist. I'm not a printer. I don't know the particulars of what type of powder you need. Um, you know, the UV reactive printing is pretty common in the Asian customs market. Mm -hmm. If you'd like, I can maybe ask around and see if I can help find a supplier. I, I think it's kind of my, my job. I'll figure it out. I think it's plutonium. Okay. I think that's what they call it, uranium or something like that. It's, it's definitely toy safe. I'm sure of that. That doesn't sound very safe at all. <laughs> well, I'm not too sure. <laughs> I was like, I'm having Back to the Future vibes here. You might know. be getting a whole, a whole new uh, slew of issues with that. You know, there'd be people trying to build nuclear bombs <laughs> with them if they buy enough of them. Um, no, but that, you know, so back to your original question, like, um, yeah, I do kind of feel like, uh, look, I've got over the mostly the self-deprecating part of my personality that says like, "Oh, you guys really want it? I can't believe you want it." Like, I accept that we make some stuff that's that people are interested in, and we try to service that. It used to be a time and place like I'd sell you anything just because like here I am trying to like put nipples on a Lego figure for a living, and if anybody wants <laughs> to buy it, that's like such a blessing to me that I'm like, here, here, just take it, you know, no backseas kind of thing. But now we have to be a little smarter about it because I understand that I, I just really hate when people want something and are willing to put money in your hand. And if you can't get it to them because of some supply chain or some lack of business acumen on my part, you know, that really is the part that bothers me. So my other alternative is to like jack the prices through the ceiling and only like a certain echelon of people will be able to engage with it. And I don't think that that's the kind of yeah. business I want to run, you know? Yeah. Yeah. See, I had a question, but I want to skip it for a minute because you're talking about scarcity of parts. And I was curious about what your thoughts were on the current situation with several Bricklink sellers being found to have had been selling bootleg parts. Oh, and man. Has this affected your business at all? Not that I know of. You know, this is this is like, I consider this to be a, a character flaw, toxic trait of mine is that I spend a lot of time, almost all the time, working on Citizen Brick stuff, but very little time on Discord servers or anybody who's tried to email me or direct message me knows I, I don't spend a lot of time communicating. It's, it, it's, it's um, not the best allocation of my resources sometimes. So... The way I found out about like a rash of bootleg parts on Bricklink is the day that I got like five emails and 10 text messages and a phone call of all people saying, do you know that you have, you have bootleg parts in your shop? And do you know that you know, like you would think that Citizen Brick was selling like. Didn't even ask you if you had them just because <laughs> you're outright of having them. They, you would think that we were selling like fake insulin to babies or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> the panic the panic that people were like do you know what's going on like people who i don't talk to regularly calling me just to make sure that they knew that you know there was like a problem and part Is that of that self-preservation like because they worry about their stuff or because they worry about your business i just think it was like a panic in the community and that's fine i mean it's it's really it's a lesson for any custom uh, custom Lego maker that there's only so far you can stray away from genuine Lego parts before the community will reject it like a bad kidney transplant. You know, I think in this particular seller, and I don't want to libel anybody. It's not, not my place to do that, but there were some sellers that were selling what turned out everyone commonly agrees were bootleg parts. And because the, you know, we were on record as being a purchaser of something from that company. People just assume that we're buying bootleg parts. And I don't know how many people took the leap of logic to say like Citizen Brick is knowingly selling fake Lego parts. We we didn't sell anything that we bought from any of those companies. We had them. You know, I, I definitely bought 800, you know, torsos 
and and they were sitting on the shelf in the queue to do something with and come to find out that they're probably counterfeit. So we um, got our money back through PayPal and that's it. That's the end of that. Um, as far as we know, we don't have, we've never sold anything fake. If I'm, if I'm getting kind of like a little hesitant to say it, cause I'm trying to choose my words <laughs> carefully, you know, well, you just add to the best of my knowledge. No, I mean, definitely, <laughs> to, definitely to the best of our knowledge. Like we, I got, I felt goofy because I got, I got, I got tricked. You know what I mean? Like I should have known that like, oh, that's too good to be true. And I'm not the only one, obviously, but um, I saw a good deal and I bought it. And to find that in retrospect, like, oh yeah, I guess these are kind of fake. They, they look better than a lot of the fake ones. I say, I see that somebody really went through the trouble to make them. But no, we didn't. Uh, we didn't use any fake parts knowingly, and as far as I know, Citizen Brick stuff is all printed on genuine Lego parts, um, with the exception of the ones that we mold ourselves. So, do you um, do you have any insight? And you don't have to answer this question about the Bricklink seller's motivation. Like, was it something they were aware of, or I couldn't speak to that. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Know. But, That's but, good. I mean, I, I'm just thinking of every scenario possible. That might that'd be an interesting documentary itself is you know the pressure as a big rank seller to maintain stock and I don't want to throw a, a hand grenade into this conversation, but like it is an interesting topic that considering we're all making toys that would not be blessed by Lego, and and there seems to be like a universal kind of like contempt for other brands of bricks, let's say. Um, competition Lego bricks. Like, I'd be curious how closely people hold on to the idea that my custom Lego figures, minifigs, need to be on 100% Lego parts. Given oh, that this has already all... happened, this has already happened. What do you um, mean? So it's it's already out there. Um, there has been some, you know, Asian market custom printed figs that have been found that some of the torsos hmm. were indeed bootleg. Discussions in that particular Discord channel were found that they didn't care. They were happy oh, to have their fig. Some wanted reprints. Um, others right. were mostly the, the minority of saying, I don't care. It's a great looking fig. You didn't notice anyway. My personal stance is if I'm paying 80, 90, 130 for a fig, I want some fucking genuine Lego parts. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. fair. I, I I don't know where I come down on that. I think, um, and I say this not. My concern, one of my one of my concerns as a guy who does this, is, man, there's a lot more custom Lego people than there used to be, right? Like when we started, there was a few, and there's definitely it's. I'm happy to be part of a a, a scene that is getting bigger. That's good for everybody, I think. But we're all. It feels like we're all um, building log cabins out of the same forest. You know, we're definitely right. shortage of parts, and. To me, considering how many people, I, I, digital printing, printing resin, like 3D resin printed accessories, there's so many different kind of like ways of customizing a figure now. Maybe I'm just not holding on as tightly as I used to be, being like, it has to be Lego, you know, because certainly Lego, I don't think has made it much easier. They're not, you know... I, I, they've never, as far as I know, really blessed custom Lego as kind of like a subgenre of what they do. Oh, absolutely uh, not. They've they've shut down several digital printers that you had long-standing accounts on eBay that have been forced to either shutter or go on face uh, sell through Facebook or their own personal websites. Yeah, um, is that, is that I, I, copyright I, reasons? Because that's yeah, I, I think they're hitting the license, they're hitting the, the license stuff, the Star Wars stuff. And the Marvel well, stuff, and I think that's, that's what different. draws the attention. In that, in that respect, I'm much more conservative. And you've heard me talk about this on other podcasts, I'm sure. You know, yep. we don't do Star Wars because I don't want to get blown up, and also because it's not, it's not for me. I mean, I, I appreciate. I know it's kind of a running joke, like how many Spider-Man figures are out there. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it's not. Oh, I don't. Have I know. <laughs> I don't have a dog in that fight. We don't, we don't make them, but I think I know because I know that's a touchier subject for Lego to be sure. So, um, I don't pretend to know what they're thinking about. We, I always feel like we're just a little bit outside their jurisdiction so they don't mess with us too much. 
I can count on one hand the amount of times that Lego's actually contacted us over the years. So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't know, man. I like making custom toys. I like that they all have Lego DNA for sure. I think personally, after this many years, it's been really fun for us to see like how many kind of like things can we make that are derivations of a Lego minifigure without it being like a fake Lego minifigure. Because I think what we're all talking about, we all agree that like fake Captain America figures on Alibaba where you can buy like 10 of them for a dollar. Like that's, that's junk. We're not really talking about that stuff, you know? Right. But I don't know. I, I think there's a lot of different ways to make a lot of different materials. We, we, Lord knows I have spent a lot of money recently doing injection molding stuff and trying to do production molds overseas. It's a, it's a big process, you know, but we want to make quality toys too. But yeah, I know yeah, I like how you said a derivative of Lego. And that's that's kind of like why I did that post on Facebook with all the different neutral heads and yellow heads. Because <laughs> that I mean, I, I the misprint culture, I'm a I'm a I'm a bit obsessive compulsive. And when I when I see like something I like, I want to get all of it. So if I dive into misprints, I'm gonna lose my mortgage on my house. That's uh so, like you that are keeping me afloat, man. That's <laughs> yeah. So I, I tend to stick to just the yellow heads. Mm -hmm. uh, if I get a misprint color, it's yellow because it matches all the neutral heads. I love the neutral heads and the different warp neutral faces because it's just like a perverse dream of what Lego could be. Yeah, that's I mean, that's, <laughs> I think that's the space that we live in. And that's my favorite kind of altitude to, yeah. to kind of fly at. OK, so that's going to wrap up uh, part one of our interview with Joe from Citizen Brick. There's at least two, maybe three more episodes on the way. We go into some of his more crazy promotional efforts, such as Cocaine Bear and Boner Wonderland mail-off pieces. We'll go into his pricing structure and process therein. Uh, those two episodes, maybe three episodes, uh, will be coming in the near future. Uh, until then, I just want to do a quick reminder that if you want to show support for this podcast and my efforts, uh, there will be links in the show notes or in my Instagram bio that will take you to the Buy Me Coffee link or my print shop. And uh, every dollar earned goes back into paying for the services and equipment used for this podcast. As always, you are never obligated, but it is always appreciated. And until next time, take care of yourself, take care of each other, and I'll see you next episode. Bye. I want you on my rack. I want to make you ring. I want you to unwrap. I want to pull your string. Bring me the next time.